wish I could turn off this um, like recording in progress voice. I never. It's always annoying to me. I kind of. Anyway. And it sounds robotic. It's weird. Yeah. All right. Welcome. This is the Frequencies Podcast with my guest Kalea Van Driel. Thank you for joining, Kalea. Thank you for having me. We uh, we met in Austin just last month at the Austin HD meetup, which was pretty cool. I've been. Uh, pushing Dave to have, you know, he's a second line, so I give him a lot of shoulds. Um, maybe you can help me as a fellow 5-1. I've been pushing him to have an Austin HD conference. I think it'd be really good. I, I agree. I know he's kind of wary of opening up his, his home to other people, though, so. He has a stage in his living room. I mean, an actual stage. Like, <laughs> If you have a stage that people can be on in your living room, I think it's already... The room itself wants to be a public place, but but I get it. The whole second line thing. I mean, well, and also the fifth line thing. I mean, we're five ones. We're we're a little bit paranoid about what are people going to find in the medicine cabinet, or you know, <laughs> what's the no? <laughs> Just a lot of weed here, actually. But uh, no, um, but you know what I mean. Fifth lines like to be a little, uh, you know, we like to be cagey. We like to be a little behind the curtain. So. Well, it's important. And we also don't, I don't think we have a choice in being behind the curtain or not. I've read that it's, it's important to create like a persona to be able to function behind. So that's what people interact with. And then you get to go do whatever you want in private, but. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We kind of have a public face and a private face. And those are, those are yeah. all different sometimes. So, um, well, I'm excited for our chat today. I know we've talked a little bit about, uh, astrology and human design. So, yeah. yes. Were, were you an astrologer before getting into human design? I mean, are you still kind of practicing astrology? Are you? So I have a I have a background in studying, you know, as an armchair um, position, Western astrology charts, and then also the Chinese four column system, and also Tibetan through Tibetan medicine. Um, the one that I'm most familiar with, though, because I've I say because of inner vision is the Western birth chart and wheel. Mm, so very cool. part of my, I'd say frustration, I have a lot of frustration with human design, but part of it was understanding how putting in my birth time information, how it gets graphed, right? Because <laughs> from, and how does like, how does the system come up? as having these centers versus these channels, things like that. So I decided, I'm not sure quite why, but to really go into looking at each of the gates and where they show up in relation to the Western Zodiac. So yeah, I, um, I decided to go through, i just go through my chart specifically to see different gates and their they're themes because I do have basis in the E chain, but it's not the most concise language, particularly to con to explain to other people. Um, and I enjoy talking about human design and astrology with other people. So I have a Scorpio stellium of almost six. Oh no, of six. And so basically, I have most of the spleen. And I didn't. It was surprising to me because I thought that would be in perhaps the solar plexus or more so oh wow that's really cool what program is this one this is humanarchetypes.com so yeah here's just kind of oh, a, i've never used this right one. and just because you were talking about the spleen and you're saying um right so we can even see this actually shows the signs one of the reasons i, I like this one so whoa like yeah, 44 so cool. yeah scorpio you know it kind of shows and yeah, we also see that you're 43 up in the Ajna. That's also in Scorpio. Yes. And Venus in, in Gate 1 is in Scorpio in the G Center. Oh, and it has all the variables after it. So that's some yeah, of so stellium. And then the personality sign, of course, Gate 50. Yes. So that's, exactly. that's your stellium right there. You're talking. Oh, and then uh, Pluto. Yep. Yep. Yes. So... I was I was surprised by that, but also when looking at 50 makes a kind of sense to me that it is right on the border there, the cusp with Libra, and that's known as the, the gate of, you know, making rules and ordering the collective and, and 
justice in a way, you know, so it seems like a very Libra theme. Um, but, I, and then looking at what powers, you know, the, the root pressure up to the spleen, because I do have that gate of judge, uh, channel of judgment. And I was surprised, but actually kind of not after looking at the themes, uh, how much cap is down there. That I think right, I Capricorn is uh, 38, 54, right? It's it's quite a bit in the, um, uh, but then also 61, interestingly, and uh, and six, but then 60, yeah, it's another root gate. And yes. You had a lot of Capricorn uh, in the root, but, um, and then gate 10, interestingly, is the other Capricorn gate, which kind of makes sense. It's, it's In the now, right? That's like being in the now uh 20 is the now 10 is actually about behavior and so you know knowing how to act formally in a formal situation oh that's right 10 yeah. 20 i guess would be knowing how to behave in the now or, or you know um the keynoting i usually give yeah you have a, a pretty open you have an open um integration bundle here the keynoting i usually give is that 34 is doing 57 is knowing uh, 10 is about themselves and then 20 is doing it now or kind of like not, you know, procrastinating. So people that have 34, 20 are just always getting things done immediately. The moment it comes up, they don't wait, but if they don't have 57, they might literally not know what they're doing since 57 is <laughs> knowing and 34 is doing, and it might have nothing to do with them because gate 10 is what makes it relevant to ourselves. Um, but yeah, of those, you know, 10 is the love gate and it's, uh, there's this cardinal grand square of 10, 15, 46, and 25, and those are the solstice yes. equinox points. And so that's kind of- Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, you have the solstice points, uh, 10 and 15, and then the equinox points, 46 and 25. And they're in the cardinal signs. So you have Capricorn Cancer, and then you have um, Libra and Aries. 46 is Libra, 25 is Aries. Uh, mm -hmm. They're all cusps, but they're um, because they're the equinoxes and the solstices. And so, but it's just like, yeah, I love Capricorn. Capricorn's kind of my go to example when I'm talking to astrologers to explain how if you describe Capricorn as well behaved, but also very ambitious, well, the behavior is 10, ambition is 54. And, you know, willing to struggle for a long time for something that they believe in, that's 38. Not like mm -hmm. the flash in the pan fighter of Aries, but the long term, you know, year over year, the whole lifetime of, of being, you know, stubbornly fighting for something of purpose. That's a very Capricorn theme, the goat slowly yes. going up the mountain. And, and then 58 is an interesting one because it's called the joyous. And people are like, really? Right. Capricorn are joyous? Well, they're, uh, they're enjoying, you know, it's the joy that fuels improvement and making things better. The joy that goes into fixing things. Um, 60 is yeah. kind of an easy one to see because it's limitation. And so it's easy to understand Capricorns as being comfortable with limitation, kind of what can you do making a lot with a little being thrifty or miserly, or how do we, how do we do a lot with these limitations, these constraints that we have? And then 61 is another one that kind of surprises people with Capricorn. Um, because it's so deeply mystical, but it does kind of fit with an almost like Merlin wizard theme of Capricorn in a way. Uh, right. I think people have to... Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, well, it's just like different than like the Neptune mysticism. It's like Saturn mysticism, you know, it's a very different kind of, uh, but it still is mystical. Capricorn can be very mystical. Yes, yes. And uh, yes, to go off of that, I think people... The, there's kind of this built in, I don't want to say persona, but filter for Capricorn as a, a very public sign in a way because of being out and working socially. And that's where a lot of these themes come into play. But as a, if we just look at the animal, it's like this weird chimera, right? And if mm. you get to know them personally, it can be really weird, quirky, goofy people. So to have some of these other gates in there, from my perspective, makes makes a lot of sense. They're, it's a very big breadth of the kind of personality. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I do enjoy about human design. And also, if you learn more about Western astrology, that and I, I bet a lot of people watching this back will, since you mentioned people who use this as a professional, or professionals in doing this, that we just water down something to almost a caricature. We don't really get everything that we need about a particular or 
information about a particular kind of type, right? So mm -hmm. that's yeah. a good point. I'm going to share uh, another, just another interesting graphic. In, in preparation for this, mm -hmm. I just put together a few. Uh, let's see, which one is it? Um, oh, interesting. Here it is. Perfect. So this was a graphic put together by Zen Human Design, um, humandesignsystem.com. They use kind of interesting keynotes. They made up their own keynotes, which, you know, for the undeveloped one, I don't, I don't like that. I see where they're going with it. Youthful folly, you know. Some of these make more sense. Two, receptiveness, okay. Mm -hmm. The keynotes I'm not so interested in, but I do like that they put the center and they put... Um, you know, it's also, it's a little bit annoying that it's in the order of the King Win sequence. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. It'd be nicer if it was actually grouping all of Scorpio together, because it's a little bit tricky. You gotta like, okay, here's Scorpio, then you got to kind of look, here's the next Scorpio we find. But they're just putting them, you know, in, a, in this sequence. But then they also have the center, which is kind of interesting, kind of nice, like... Oh, we can see um, gate six is in the solar plexus, and that's in Virgo. It's kind of interesting that, Vir you know, Virgo in the solar plexus, really? Virgo in the emotional center? I, I guess so, you know? Um, yes, yes, we were talking sense. about that, yeah. Yeah, you know, military leadership in Leo. Okay, that kind of makes sense. Um, so, and actually there was another, let me see, is it, uh, it might have been this one. Oh, yeah, this was a nice, interesting one. So this is what I was just talking about. Oh, yeah, this is from, uh, this. This is from Eleanor Haspel Portner, who's, um, she does, yeah, it's Noble Sciences. It's like Unified Life Sciences, Noble Sciences. She's a very interesting researcher, Eleanor Haspel Portner. She's, I'm a big fan of her work. Um, and this is something she wrote in 2009. But it's just kind of, she's just showing, um, Oh yeah, and here we see, of course, the astrological associations. But um, but yeah, it's interesting to see the grand, the the two grand squares. You know, the the grand uh, cardinal square, Capricorn, Cancer, Libra, Aries, and the grand fixed square is the other is the other gates of the G center. And then there's another one I have. Um, this one I don't know who made this. So if any viewers want to credit it, please do. But I really liked uh, this. Was just what somebody. Uh, Yes, together yes. showing the gates of Taurus and it's like so you find these like interesting things where um you know it is just kind of interesting like it's not like there's a consistent pattern but you know Libra and Scorpio is mainly spleen or Taurus is mainly the center column of individual gates it also has gate 27 so that's kind of a red herring there but, or like Gemini is mainly throat gates or Capricorn's yes. mainly root gates. Pisces is mainly solar plexus gates. Like there are some interesting, you know, there's interesting patterns that we can see. It's hard to turn it into a formula. Like I, for a while I was trying to like crack the code. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't able to, there wasn't, you know, it wasn't like there was a big code in that sense, but still it's cool. You know, it's, it's, it's cool stuff. So, but yeah, I, um. I, I love doing this kind of research. It's definitely something I myself have done. So you were saying like Scorpio was kind of your first entry point into this of just kind of like, why is all of Scorpio in the spleen or what's going on here? How do these associate? Well, I didn't, I didn't even realize that. I didn't even realize that it was all in the spleen. I, I don't know if it all but... is. I mean, there might be, let's see, there might be a couple that aren't in the spleen. Um, yeah, I guess there's... there's the one. I have the one, which I also thought was interesting that it's... Um, because you mentioned the king win sequence that it's yeah, one. So of course one and fourteen and are not in the spleen, and those are in the but yeah. But sorry, right. go on. Right. But the um here, let me pull that up. I was very because I also have the forty one, which is also in my cross, which is at the start of human design. So it both it both has this kind of starter energy, but it in different ways. And I wouldn't really consider that a, a Scorpio thing until I reflected a little more. I'm like, well, no, it's classically ruled by Mars. So it kind of has that similar Aries energy of, of initiating. But then 41 is in Aquarius. That's a kind of an unusual place to start. You know, it's... Um... Right. But it's like the dreaming aspect, like what is possible? And I have possibility mm. versus probability. Um, is that view? I forget what that's called, but... Right, right, view. 
which which makes a lot of sense in, in that aspect. And I made a joke that it's like the ultimate Pisces gate, but it's right on the cusp there, right? And I didn't realize that, which is another part which is funny to me. When I initially first learned about human design, I was, in, well, I probably should give it a little bit of background. I was introduced to PHS through my TCM and acupuncturist, but I didn't realize what we were working with was human design or PHS. Um, in their research, they actually mapped a bunch of meridians and also individual points to particular gates and channels. And that was part of their research. Oh, I would love to see that research. I mean, that's there's a guy named Martin Grassinger who's done some stuff like that, particularly with homeopathy. But um, I'm a big fan of Chinese medicine. I go to a Chinese medicine practitioner for acupuncture and, and so on. And I would love to see those correlations because uh, there are so many similarities. And I see here your PHS is hot thirst. Is that right? No, it should be cold. Oh. Oh, then I guess we might have the wrong uh, birth time for you or sometimes... Okay, well, we'll have to return to that. Maybe um, when we take a break, I can make sure that I enter the right birth time and or that the UTC time is correct. Oh, oh, I'm looking at the wrong one. That's my, okay, user error. We do have the right time. Uh, here it is, yeah, cold, sorry. Color three, tone four. I was looking at environment, your um, wet kitchens. Wet kitchens, yes. Right, right, sorry. I just, some, sometimes You're I good. just look to the wrong. <laughs> there are quite a few numbers on here, yeah. Yeah, yes, so. quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Cold, cold thirst, thirst, which of course is the uh, is tone four. I was looking at the tone three here, which is the the wet kitchens. Yeah, the kitchens. Yes, but it's interesting you bring that up because that was that is my literal entry point. So the first thing that he mentioned was like, "How is a uh, Texas treating you? Are you handling the heat well?" And in China and in Chinese medicine, I used to live in China, that when any, when you're sick, when you have a cough, when you feel under the weather, if you break a bone, if you like have some kind of mental cloudiness, they just tell you which means drink hot water. You're supposed to raise your body temperature in order to get the chi moving to re-regulate your system. And he said, no, no, for you, you're supposed to drink cold water. And coming from a TCM practitioner, I was like, what? Particularly as a woman, like you're not supposed to do anything cold or cold foods because of um, reproductive things. And for a while, I'm like, I don't know what this dude's talking about. I don't know. I'll do the other things, but not that. That seems very odd to me. But I, when it finally became cold here, cold Texas level cold, um, it was really amazing that my, my head cleared up and I was a completely different person. Mm. And I was like, oh, man, I hate how he's right, but I don't understand how he's right. <laughs> yeah. So it was in 2020 that I finally realized and discovered that we were using human design, particularly the PHS system. And I think, one, because of his ex experience in, being, in using the I Ching as, through Chinese medicine to treat people, it makes a lot of sense. But also, as a projector, my environment is extremely important, not just physically, but also everyone can see I have an open G center. Yeah. That who I'm around and what my environment is, is what's going to draw what's important to me. So there are ways for me to modify this in Texas, like going to all the cold springs that we have here in Austin, which is great. But yeah, it's been a really interesting, interesting ride to be, to be honest with you. And I don't know where necessarily in my chart it is, but I have been conditioned in the past uh, as a five one having a lot of, I think most of mine is one and then I have five lines if I'm not mistaken. Um, but having that open head, open G center and open, um, completely open solar plexus that a lot of conditioning that makes me very wary of uh, communities, particular ways of thought and ideologies and not wanting to drink the Kool-Aid. And when things resonate so strongly and so specifically, it's hard to really ignore those things. So there's that's part of my annoyance with human design personally. Um, mm -hmm. It's like, I, I don't want to do this, but also it fits. So it's what I spend a lot of my time reading and researching, right? And there's so much to know. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. Yeah, well, um, your chart is split, and it's a simple split on gate 16 uh, only. That's the only bridging gate for you. So anytime you see these 
simple splits with only a single bridging gate, which is quite rare. Most simple splits have multiple really? ways of being bridged. But that can really put an entire focus much stronger even than the undefined G or the wide open solar plexus or the undefined sacral or undefined head. It's just going to be this gate 16. And so it's a little interesting when you are kind of looking at the orientation of a chart uh, in terms of the not self and kind of the not self hierarchy. There's not a ton of material out there on the bridging gates, even though for a split definition person, they are primary and the centers are secondary. So, yes, you know, yes. you might not Absolutely. relate a lot. Well, also, when you have this much openness and a completely open center and only two two gates pointing at it, um, you might not relate a lot to the undefined solar plexus stuff. You might say undefined solar plexus, avoiding confrontation. I never avoid confrontation, I, you know, and so on. That might not really click. But the gate 16 stuff is going to be very important. And so understanding what gate 16 is about is basically gate 16 is very skeptical. It is here to experiment for themselves and to be the one who experiments. And so the not self of this bridging gate is going to say, I'm the one who experiments. I will experiment with it. I will determine what works and what doesn't in the experiment rather than trusting other experimenters, you know, because it's kind of like, I don't want to give away my autonomy to other experimenters and, you know. Ah, okay. <laughs> and there's a lot of pressure on that. Yeah, well, there's just a lot of, right, because you also have, you have everything else leading up to it. You have 58, 18, and 48, which are in the same little, the same, uh, same stream. It's called the stream of taste. So, yeah, well, very interesting stuff. Um, and yeah, that Scorpio, Scorpio packed spleen. Um, very cool. I mean, you have all the spleen gates except 57 and 32. So this is just a very splenic configuration here. And then you can kind of see it's like not a lot. I mean, there's a lot of openness. Similar to my chart, I don't have a defined spleen uh, or ego, but I do have more splenic activation. And then I have a completely open solar plexus as well. So... Well, uh, let's take a let's take a short break. When we return, uh, we can talk. Maybe talk a little more about the solar plexus, and then I have a couple yeah. things to share on astrology. I'd love to hear more of your observations as well, things you've found, and your journey from uh, TCM and PHS. Very interesting way to enter into human design. I love, you know, how people get into human design through these different avenues, and uh, I'd like to hear more about it as well. And of course, with the Gate Fifty Sun, which is part of the health system and the defense circuit and you know this is um responsibility being responsible and uh it's actually the root of intelligence as well um so gate 50 is all about you know not only splenic intelligence but the root of making intelligent decisions to protect the life and so on and so uh you know it seems fitting that you would kind of get into human design through chinese medicine or through something that is aimed at uh, being responsible for taking care of the form. You also have gate 46, as I do. That's my yes. personality son. Oh, love of the body, yeah. Love of the body, exactly. And so, yeah, you have Jupiter. Uh, yeah, or is that, uh, that's 42, excuse me. Where's your 46? Uh, oh, it's your yeah. south node. Interesting. Oh, it's on the yeah. fifth line as well. I always yeah. love nodal connections. Uh, I have 25.5 and 46.5. That's my personality earth oh. personality sun so i always love when i uh, you know my sun earths line up to someone's nodes it's we it's you know typically a, a strong connection and kind of one of the classics so okay we'll take a short break and uh, be back soon So um, I definitely have a lot to say about the undefined solar plexus, but uh, first I wanted to share. Go ahead. <laughs> so first I wanted to share um, just something that I had worked on, which which was when I was first getting into human design, I was really trying to figure out the aspects of the channels because I thought, well, this is interesting. There's three channels that are opposition, so this is what I put together. And um, the three channels that are opposition are the 4323, 
Uh, and then we have um, the 3420 here, gate 34 and gate 20. That's an opposition. But then I, and then we have, of course, the 3740. Um, and those are the three channels that are the most represented um, overall, simply because yeah. anytime the sun, which is also an interesting point that in astrology, we don't really use the earth as an activation, but well, there's no concept of activation anyway, but we don't really look at the earth as much as like, maybe we just kind of include the understanding of the earth in our understanding of the sun. Like someone with Libra sun automatically has Aries earth. So we just kind of build that into the description. But of course, in human design, we, um, we use the earth more. And so anytime the sun is in 37, the earth's in 40, or anytime the sun is in 40, the earth's in 37. And the same with uh, the nodes, you know, the north node in one, the south node in the other. So, so these three oh. channels are very heavily overrepresented. You find a lot more people with 3740. You find a lot more people with 3420 and a lot more people with 4323. Um, that they're just the most common channels because, you know, the sun takes 5.7 days to go through a gate. So you already have 11 days each year where just the sun and earths are making this channel uh, just automatically every year, you know, and the same for the other two. But I didn't really see much pattern in the others. I mean, you know, 1648 is a trine, uh, 4253 Whoa. is a square. So, you know, because these are the channels, right? This is, and this is kind right. of, um, it's not the easiest to read. I, I apologize, but this was just something I was trying to do. Uh, 60 and three is a square. Any of these that it's are a square. square Interesting. Yeah. Any of these that are square to each other are actually going to be part of certain incarnation crosses because um, the reason being, uh, and there's a couple that are actually part of incarnation crosses that I have, I've missed here, like, like 2212, actually. Um, hmm, I wonder why that is. It must be because I'm not including. Yeah. So, so any of them that are a square to each other, when the personality sun, which is just the sun is mm -hmm. in what is in the gate um, that's ahead, then because the design sun will be 88 degrees retrograde. See what I'm saying? So yeah, that's close okay. to being a square. It's like a two degree yes. orb square. So it'll right. actually activate that channel. And so we also end up with an overabundance of people that have 360 um, because it's square, or we have an overabundance of uh, 23, sorry, that's the degree, 5342, uh, which is square. So just some kind of interesting points here. This isn't the best to read. I, I'd like to make a nicer, you know, make an interesting graphic of it. Um, but I just wanted to share this because this was something that I was doing in, in my research when I Yeah, I find that, that very fascinating. That's really interesting. Um, yeah. And this, I would like to add something to this is kind of fun, funny in my, my side that I just realized this week and that I, I have been explaining human design incorrectly to people who are asking me about it, but in relationship to crosses, right, and having those squares, that because of how my sun and earth are placed, that I just assumed it was the Western cross, your IC, MC, ascendant, and descendant. And no, it's following where the sun is and then the 88 degrees, right? And, and that's not the same for everybody. Well, yeah, and there, there's a number of crosses. Like, um, <laughs> absolutely. Like, oh, no, this is wrong. <laughs> Well, so there's the incarnation cross, and then there's also the cross of life. And the cross of life is not going to be like a square cross, but the cross of life is to look, for instance, on your personality side at the sun, earths, and the nodes. And they also make a cross, but of course the cross could be, I mean, it's not even a cross sometimes. If your nodes are the same as the sun, earth, it'll just be a line. Right, so, right. because, you know, it could be anywhere like that, but um before Ra ever developed the incarnation cross, he actually, the first thing he taught long before type, before profile, any of it, he taught the cross of life. And that was the sun, earth, and the nodes. And he basically said, the nodes are your environment and the sun, earth is you. And, you know, the earth is what you're standing on and the sun, you're getting information from, and basically the nodes are kind of like the horizontal, like the, the stage that you're on in some sense. Oh, that's yeah, a really beautiful way to kind of think of it. If you think of like 
the nodes is the horizon line or the stage you're on, or even the direction you're going from the South to the North node. Right. Which right. is something where, um, have you ever gotten into evolutionary astrology? Do you know that system at all? Or I, I'm, someone has mentioned it to me before. I don't know specifically what it's about. However, my intuition is that the South node is what you come in with karmically and you're being mm -hmm. led to the dragon's head of the North node. And that's like mm -hmm. destiny where you're being pulled. Is that yeah, kind of- Yeah, and that's pretty, that's compatible with the, uh, pretty compatible with EA and also with um, human design. Uh, I just mentioned it because of all the astrological schools that I studied, evolutionary astrology had some of the closest, although still pretty different in significant ways. Um, so- yeah, let me uh, let me go back to sharing your chart for a minute. So, do you have any? Yeah, say more about that. On, I'm interested uh, about that. Yeah, I guess we have a few a few interesting um, ways we could go with this. One was just the spleen with this packed spleen and kind of you getting into HD through Chinese medicine. Any observations there? Or I'm also just curious, either from a Chinese medicine perspective or your own observations, the undefined solar plexus and what that's been like. Um, so really either, either way. So, uh, I guess to answer your first question, I have a lot of things to say about the spleen, both, um, in jest, but also uh, reflecting in more in spirit in experience, but in TCM and kind of similar to um, the, the nine centered design of human design is that there are concepts of organs that don't necessarily relate one-on-one um, -on -one to our physical organs. So there's the concept of there's hollow organs and there's also uh, non-hollow organs to, to make it simple. And each of those has an emotion related to it and also has an element related to it. So for the spleen, it is actually, um, and related to the kidneys is fear. So I find that interesting because each of the gates relates to a, a particular fear, like fear of taking on responsibility, fear of repeating the past, which I have both of those, fear of the um, authority and those kind of situations. So when I was working with that acupuncturist, a lot of the things that we had to um, correct in imbalances in my system is having um, easiest way to say is depletion of splenic and kidney energy which also the the kidneys are viewed as like the, the powerhouse right and i think that can relate to the um the sacral no no oh interesting yes, yes. well and wouldn't yes. and aren't, aren't the kidneys kind of i know in human design it's more in 3740 but i, I think tcm the kidney is kind of the great water is that the yes. water in the in the yes. symbolically? And it's kind of what like maybe the kidneys and the heart are almost like yin and yang to each other or kind of have this. Yes, yes. Because the heart is about fire. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's a uh, when when she can be depleted, it can be either where there it could be stagnated and needs to be uh broken up or moved, like kind of instigated, which means, uh, makes sense for me is Scorpio being a very fixed sign, right? It's the fixed of all the water. So it's like ice, right? That's how I, I tell myself that. Um, but it also could be where there's too much, there's not enough structure. So there is drainage, if that makes sense. There's a depletion because there isn't enough structure to withhold it. So when I reflect on that, and I haven't, I haven't gone, I don't know enough about TCM and the particular meridians and points, because it's very complicated. It takes a long time to learn, and I have an formal training. But to look at what my, um, that acupuncturist did with the research in relation to the points and the lines and how it relates to certain parts of the body, I see if I did take a picture of it one time, I'll see if I can find it. But um, yeah, that's, that's my my main reflection on that just because it's my authority and being having to learn to be in my body to actually hear it because it's not loud right where in contrast you have the emotional center which is loud for everybody but louder for those of us who don't have it because it's amplified times twice mm -hmm. um and if you act and respond to those things that 
especially with my my system i'm an energy projector so when i get latched into an energy system I'm like oh i can do this and i'd be a i become a super manifesting generator right mm -hmm. and it can burn me out more quickly right i'm a depletely deplete me easier mm -hmm. so absolutely and so and you're saying yeah you, like i mean i also have a completely undefined solar plexus for me it's kind of um I'll either be out of touch with the emotions or then like, say somebody comes along with a 55 in your case, suddenly, yeah, it's amplifying it to a very extreme point or just they have a defined solar plexus already. Yeah. Um, although for instance, you and I don't activate each other's solar plexus. So if we are to be in aura together, um, it actually it is kind of nice sometimes. It's, it's such a rarity. I think yes. around 10% or less of any two people in the world have an undefined solar plexus together. That was a statistic from partnership really? analysis. Yeah, because 50% oh. automatically have a defined solar plexus. Then you have 14 possible activations in the solar plexus center. So there's seven opportunities for, for an electromagnetic. And it's around a one in three, um, you know, it, it depends on the gate because some gates are overrepresented, but uh, or for periods of time, like Pluto or Neptune kind of make one gate very strong for a couple of years or, you know, right. a lot of activation. Obviously, um, Neptune transiting Pisces is activating a lot, you know, in the solar plexus now. So people born in this past 15 years will have higher chance of having solar plexus activation. But overall, yes. I haven't confirmed this, but, um, you know, it's probably anywhere from 10 to 15 percent of any any two people. Uh, that don't have a defined solar plexus. Now, in your case, in my case, we're going to have, it's much more common for us to not have a defined solar plexus with someone else, because if they have an undefined solar plexus and they don't have 55 or 30, they could have any other gate activation. It doesn't make a difference. It's not going to define it for you. You know what I mean? Right. right. And in my yeah. case, I only have a hanging gate 12. I don't have anything in the solar plexus system. Oh, wow. 12. So if they don't have 22, it doesn't activate for me, period. So, um, I mean, unless there's transits and things like that, but I mean, I'm just saying, uh, yeah, like we definitely do amplify, but we also have the interesting experience of not having a defined solar plexus with someone, which is a more rare experience in the world. Uh, yes. And it was very nice being in aura with you in that aspect. I think, is Elena the same way? Where she's completely open as well, I forget. But yeah, it, it was it, interesting for us to be all together and like, oh, it's like you can take a breath. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? it because does. it's it's the strongest motor, right? It's the strongest yeah. motor. And I think, what is it, 75, 80% are either emotional or sacral or both defined, right? Which is a lot of energy yeah. for our system. Wow. Yeah, that makes sense, right? Because if 70% roughly are are... Yeah, sacral, and then you have the other thirty percent, and half of them are, you know, emotional defined by you know statistics. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. Most people are in those two, two motors. So, um, well, so how did you, or do you have any advice? Do you have any, I guess, favorite astrology books or any advice for people getting into astrology? I was asked this last week uh, by by Mark Germain, who's an amazing human design analyst. And I thought he would be really well-versed in astrology. I just kind of assumed he would. And he said, Jonah, what, what book should I get to learn astrology? Cause he was kind of interested in it and wanting to learn. And I was like, that that's funny. You've been in human design, you know, 15 years. And uh, he was, uh, he's done a lot of mystical things before that. I just assumed he would know. Um, right. But yeah. Do you have any favorite, uh, favorite astrological texts or anything? Uh, well, to be honest with you, the direct answer is no. However, the way in which I learn, can you still hear me? Yeah, yeah. It looks like the video oh, dropped, okay, but okay. I, I can Sorry, hear you I was turn. I was looking up something that someone sent to me um, as recommendation, uh, which is something I'll get into in one second. Sure. But the way in which I study, and I don't know if it's not very typical for five one, but it comes in waves, and maybe that's because of my what is it forty six, and then also the five that I have my own, you know, structured ways of doing things. But I, I, 
I learn over time and I don't know how much I learn. And I only know unless someone like yourself asks me questions and draws it out of me. And then I'll talk for 15, 20 minutes straight about the most random things. I'm like, oh, wow, I had I had all that in there. I had no idea. Well, you also have a, uh, a right variable mind and brain system. You know, your conscious and, yes. and unconscious yes. are both right variable. So very, not very structured, like having left. Yes, that, yes, that makes sense. Thank you for pointing that out. So I, I haven't like sat down with a particular astrology book um, and gone through it and, and researched. I will usually go, I will look through uh, whatever I feel called to when I like do Google results and I'll click around or whatever I think is the most detailed and most and, and less watered down, you know, and caricatured. But I've been looking at, because I have started my Pluto square earlier than most people because of my stellium. And so Pluto is already starting to square the beginning of my stellium before getting to Pluto. So I'm going to be having my Pluto square next 19 years. And then at the same time, I'll have my Uranus opposition. Um, so I, what I want to do is check out the ephemeris, which is, you know, when each sign goes through their particular degrees. And someone gave me a recommendation for that. And then also um, other books that can go through planets when they square other planets or sextile and things like that. And for me, I'm a teacher and very visually oriented that they have really great ways of being visually organized and able to easily access. So I have not personally looked at these, but she, well, like in depth, I've seen them and gone through it a little bit, but they are written by Robert um, Pel Pelletier and Robert Hand. I don't know if it's the same, oh. but. Well, I'm familiar with, with uh, Robert Hand. He's kind of a neo-Platonist. He's quite, yeah, let me see, Robert Pelletier and Robert Hand. Yeah. Um, I didn't know that they had a book together. Oh, I see. I've seen Robert Peltier's books. I've seen um, Planets and Houses. I know that one. And I've met Robert Hand. He's he's fantastic. He's like Santa Oh, wow. Claus. Yeah. Well, he would come oh, to the that. astrological conventions that I used to go to. And uh, yeah, he's, he's very interesting um, thinker and really brings in a lot of Platonism, Neoplatonism, kind of studying Plato and going back to Greek philosophy and uh, and then later developments in philosophy, kind of Hellenistic. There's a whole movement of Hellenistic astrology, and he doesn't do that, but he draws from some of those sources as well, which is pretty cool. Oh, yes, yes. Their Hellenistic is becoming a lot more popular, I've noticed as well. Yeah, yeah Chris Brennan and um, people like that have been doing it. Uh, his wife, uh, uh, Lisa Scheim, is, is also an astrologer there. Yeah, I, I love, I mean, I still have a lot of uh, enjoyment of reading astrological texts and of just, I've been reading, um, here's one I've been looking at lately, Mythic Astrology. This is kind of a fun one. Uh, I picked it up a few months ago. Wow. And, What's uh, this about? Well, this is this is Ariel Goodman and Kenneth Johnson. I like it because I'm a big fan of the archetypal astrology work of um, Rick Tarnas, and I just like reading the archetypes and the mythology and having kind of a quick reference of like, you know, what the associations were throughout history, and um, just 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 kind of like a refresher on some of the myths. It has a lot of pictures. I like I like that part of it. I also um, I wanted to share my favorite um, or, you know, one of my favorite sources that I, I send people when they're getting into astrology, which is Richard Tarnas's introduction to archetypal astrology. And so oh. this is, um, you can just find this online. It's just an introduction to archetypal astrology. Uh, Richard Tarnas wrote a really great book called Cosmos and Psyche. And now there's actually been a documentary series that kind of tell us the story he told, which is the story of the development of Western civilization, specifically over the last 500 years, but going back further as well, through a, an ast astrological lens, which is really a cool way to look at it. And he basically looks at the planets and the aspects the planets make, and he looks at their cycles 
uh, for the global kind of historical events, he looks at the outer planet cycles. So he'll look at, right. you know, like, uh, um, you know, Neptune Uranus being birth of the internet. But if you go back, it was also the peak of the Renaissance. Or he looks at, yes. um, I guess, like Uranus Pluto, that was in the 1960s. And so that was a real revolutionary, outrageous time. But then it all, that was the conjunction. But then it went into square in the mid 2010s. And that was another kind of revolutionary time of upheaval and change. And so I'm just a big fan of his work, but he, um, you know, he explains the planetary archetypes really well and uh, probably familiar to people like us who are kind of versed in astrology, but it's still a nice, nice overview, nice descriptions. Um, he has a kind of a psychological background as well. So he can, and he works a lot with Stanislav Grof, who does um, oh, holotropic okay, breath good. work. Yeah. And so he'll talk about, uh, he uses Grof's kind of, use of the planetary archetypes where um i guess like uranus is the moment of birth where the eyes first open saturn is the building of the bones and the womb uh pluto is the sort of volcanic energy pushing the uh, baby out into the world um neptune is the kind of amniotic fluid and the time in the womb and so on and so he kind of mm -hmm. he has some very nice uh nice you know understandings in in that regard as well um it's very poetic very poetic. yeah yeah he's he's from a background of jung and james hillman who is a kind of post jungian and very very poetic and then i guess the only other um the only other thing that i have to share was just and it was a side note, one of the most interesting understandings of astrology that I, I found is from a guy named Arthur M. Young. Uh, not Jung, like Carl Jung, but Young, mm -hmm. like a young person. And this is a graphic um, that that he came up with, or someone may have added. I think in his version, he might not have the alchemical um, stuff on there. But basically, these are kind of fundamental mathematical equations and mathematical concepts like acceleration or moment of inertia, you know, uh, these are just in, th these associate to the signs. So Scorpio is momentum, whereas Libra is position, which kind of makes sense because it's about mm -hmm. the position of one thing in relation to another. Like we are in, you know, oh, okay. we have, uh, you know, relationship of some kind. Virgo is work. Leo is force. Well, they can be very forceful. Cancer is interesting because it's velocity and you would think, what is velocity? But velocity is about stabilizing the movement. Like if you're at a constant velocity, you're neither, you're, you're neither accelerating nor decelerating. So you're kind of maintaining velocity. Ha, huh, yes. Um, or, you know, Aries is kind of easy to see because that's acceleration. That's speeding up, mm -hmm. making something faster. So these are just kind of, oh, and I like that Pisces is the moment of, you know, inertia there, which is kind of, <laughs> it makes sense for Pisces or 12th house or, you know. So yes, yeah, just yeah. something I wanted to share. It's just kind of an interesting um, view of astrology. Then, what does it show in trines and squares? I guess it's just showing, uh, yeah, maybe the grand squares and the grand trines yeah that's what it is so it's the grand trines that connect you know that the trines always connect the element oh, so you have yeah, grand yeah. water trine grand so you know you kind of see these hidden connections the connection between velocity and the moment of inertia and momentum or the squares um which are between the same qualities the mutable fixed and cardinal square so yeah Arthur Arthur M. Young, he's definitely uh, someone to, to check out. And he's he was kind of like a Buckminster Fuller type figure who just um, very interesting, brilliant person who did a lot of esoteric research, but from a scientific perspective and stuff like that. Well, thank All you for right. sharing. Yeah. The only other recommendation I would have is if people, it can be a little overwhelming but there's a free app that you can also pay for ex extemporaneous things, but it's called Astro Matrix. That's what I like using because you're able to do synastry and a bunch of different kinds of charts, but also see aspects and patterns. And you can click on it and they give you a very detailed explanation of what this means in this house. And then if this is squared to whatever, um, and also gives you timing of 
what's going on throughout the world through transits, but also then personally and how it affects your birth chart. So, and it has pictures and kind of themes with each, which I liked that chunking. I have that, you know, sales channel. So mm. how do I explain this in a way that's easy for other people to understand? So Astro Matrix, I would recommend that. Very and not cool. as a text, but as if you want to not like sit down and read a book, if you're like, oh, I just want to get into this little by little and have like, oh, this is reminding me of, this transit today what does that mean nice so. yeah no that's really helpful that's great that's great yeah so also in preparation for this i grabbed my copy of Ra's black book this is a fun one this was Ra's oh. first book on human design and uh in this book he does have descriptions of the planets and it's interesting because um I mean, he, I, I like that. Like for those who haven't seen, it's just kind of, he has these planetary, I can, I can kind of read a few, but he just has these planetary descriptions that, um, you know, they make sense. I mean, they're like the sun is vitality, power, will, the ego and leadership. The earth is fertility, evolution, design, and the root. He would later revise these or develop them and talk about, the earth being grounding and then he would get more specific and talk about personality versus the design side especially in his magic square material where you know design earth is where you're kind of grounded on on the design side of if if that area is having a lot of chaos or if you're not able to achieve basically what that gate and line are talking about then the whole design side is kind of thrown off and it's hard to get in touch with strategy and authority because your design is it's kind of the root of your design stability in some sense and then on the personality side it's more about the grounding of of your um you know outer authority and how you're able to express yourself and so there's some interesting ones i mean they're, they're not too different than normal astrological interpretations mercury is the mind uh, awareness communication mental life venus is art aesthetics values uh, relationships stuff like that so they're they're fairly in line with what we would you know understand neptune is uh, imagination psychic phenomena confusion and drugs so that's a funny one and he just puts you know drugs on there but um but yeah it seemed very very raw thing to say <laughs> yeah <laughs> but he also he also urged people to develop their own personal relationship to the planets. And that's something that I like coming from an astrological background, where um, if you have a hanging gate and you notice another, it, the, the planet activates, especially for undefined centers, you know, like we have undefined solar plexus. And if you have a planet come along and it's in gate 55 or it's in gate 30, you're going to get to know that planet very well. I mean, in a very personal way where you're going to have a defined solar plexus for a period of time. If it's the moon, it's only going to be for, you know, 11 hours. If it's Neptune, it might be for two years or Pluto. Right. right? So right. it's, um, but having that experience of having that long-term activation gives you a chance to get to know that planet in a way that is not just an intellectual understanding of that planetary archetype. You can feel it physically in your body. Um, right. Right. So I, I'm really enjoying that. Well, so how about for Chinese medicine? Uh, do you have any kind of recommendations for people who are interested in learning more? I mean, is that something you kind of need to know a practitioner who can teach you or is it mostly passed down mm -hmm. through, through that? Yes. So I feel it's like, um, just like anything, particularly with PHS, you have that environment is very important in general. And a lot of, um, if you're that kind of practitioner, you're going to focus on the PHS more than necessarily those gates or those, um, or the centers, the nine centers, because the body is what's most important. They'll argue that if we're going to live out our design, the design is the body and not our personality. So focus on getting the body in ultimate equilibrium in order to, you know, be aligned with your cross, in other words. However, I'm not quite sure how many, how many practitioners use human design. I think I got lucky in that I was recommended to this person and I got to see them. 
and work with them and be introduced to human design through PHS. But Chinese medicine is so varied. It is almost like you could say it's just as variable as human design, that there are multiple different theories that you can specialize in. Um, so you would need to, it would, I don't know how to go about finding it be fine, be, besides saying, do a search and be invited in or recommended, you know, based on your authority and your type. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I think there are some, I have met some students at the, the TCM school here that are also interested and I think use it, but I don't know to what degree and in which one, but in, in what way. Um, and also the, the centers don't completely line up necessarily with the different concepts of the organs that they can. We kind of discussed that a little bit previously, but if you do have the ability and you would like to go out and try to find a practitioner, I'd highly recommend it. Um, it's been very, very influential for me. I wouldn't have human design without being introduced that way. And it's been very revolutionary for me in that way and knowing, you know, when I'm not following my PHS, I can definitely tell and it, it affects my ability to make what I think are the better decisions for me. Mm -hmm. But also if you already have one, like you, for example, it may be interesting to see what they think about human design. Um, Cause there's so many, I feel entry points, right? There's like Western astrology or there is the Kabbalah, the Zohar, there is a bunch of different things, including the I Ching. And the I Ching determines a lot of how the planets actually show up in the gates, right? Depending on the hexagram lines. And in that way, I think it would be um, attractive to practitioners to see how can I use this system, what I already know through the I Ching that we use to practice with our medicine. So that's my long answer. I don't know if it answered the question. Oh, yeah. But... Well, and, and I mean, I'm also really enjoying having a Chinese medicine practitioner who I've never approached the subject of human design about, but I really enjoy that he's willing and excited. I think part of the reason we really clicked was he's a teacher. And as he goes, he teaches. And so he tells me what pulses he's checking for and he explains them. He explains some of the oh, meanings. Wow. I get to kind of pick up, like, you know, it's kind of like, I've been to practitioners where they just, they go, oh, mm -hmm. and they just kind of do something and don't tell you. And then, but he will say, okay, well, you know, the kidney is this, the liver is this. And then I have my own understandings that I kind of slowly piece together. Uh, I also love talking with my good friend and colleague, uh, Michael Steenbeck Litvin, who's done a lot of work. Just, he has a very, he has um really amazing mind where he's just always thinking about interesting things and, and making really interesting connections. Uh, he's quad left. And so he's very much a pattern Ooh. matcher connector guy. And um, he made the connection, for instance, between drinking alcohol that depletes the liver and can be difficult on the liver. Well, the liver is the G center in human design associated with the G center. And so when someone's hung over, maybe they drank too much, the next day they can be a little bit um, aimless and directionless and feel kind of ennui and kind of feel the depletion of the G center Ooh. sense of direction. And, and so he's made some interesting, he's noted some interesting things like that. He's also pointed out for the undefined G, which might be interesting for you, that mm -hmm. um, if you're hanging out with somebody that's really correct for you and you really like them, then after you stop hanging out with them, you're going to kind of have this predisposition to like. Whereas if you're hanging out with somebody that's taking you to a place you can't stand and they're kind of feeling oppressive and they're... They're not, you know, it's like making your G center tired and kind of deadening it and making it not like then after there's like a period of time for, for it to kind of bounce back where until then somebody plays you a new song. I don't like that. Or they try to show you something new. I don't like Ooh. that. Or they kind of get stuck on not liking because he's kind of associated oh, with, center with what we like and dislike and what we're drawn to. And there can be kind of a person hangover as well of the G center. If you've been hanging out with somebody that, that you're not totally excited to hang out with or um they're kind of not not respecting your strategy and authority and not inviting you you know they they've they've gotten you in you accepted the invitation in but maybe they haven't invited you to leave and you want to leave and you're like please invite me <laughs> please invite me to get out of this conversation and 
So yes. That's yes. a kind of, I, I'm yeah, not a projector, but I've heard that that's a, you know, projector thing, get, get, getting stuck in some way, you know? Yes, yes. Because I think what is heard about most often is that not getting the in, invitation and then having the, the bitterness and the frustration and the impatience about that. But then once getting invited in, there's also what are you invited into and for how long? And so, for example, what I've noticed with my design is that because I think I'm my 43 and then I have the, the opinions one, the, what is it? The 1762 hmm. that I can be invited into a conversation sentence by sentence. And if I'm not invited into the next concept that I could automatically feel like giving information or giving opinion that was unwarranted and it completely changes the feel of the conversation. But also to speak what you're talking about, that if we're not careful about our predicting our own energetic boundaries, that if we leave according to our, like you're saying, our own strategy and authority, and the other person is not invited you to leave, it can also be that same energy of why you're doing this. I'm getting angry. I'm getting disappointed. You know, you need to stay here, especially if it's like a generator or a man gen where it's like not the question of who are you, but who am I? And you're helping me figure that out. So please don't leave. And why are you leaving? I need you to give me direction kind of thing. So yes, I think that's a very important thing to, to point out as well. And you can't, I think it's unavoidable at some point, like you're going to make people upset and you have to be as a completely open emotional center be willing to have those kind of confrontations and speaking of truth, even if it's very uncomfortable and you'll have a hangover from it because the, the wave will get set off. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's take one more break and then we can uh, discuss anything, any final thoughts, anything we want to wrap up with, but uh, we'll just take sure. one more short break and we will be back momentarily. so much Kalea for for being on how can people get a hold of you if they want to follow up on anything we're talking about so you could uh you can use my email which i can spell out which is taoista with a t zero one zero one at gmail so t's and thomas a o i s t a zero one zero one at gmail and you can send me recommendations or if you want to just chat about any things we've been talking about, I'd be more than willing to do that. I will get back to you. I have a defined ego. It just may be on my own wave in time. <laughs> so yeah. thank you for your patience. Yeah, I, I love getting email correspondence. I mean, that's something I found with you know human design is... Um, it, you can just reach out to people and sometimes people will be so nervous. They'll say, well, I'm a generator. I didn't want to initiate. Well, then just inform me that you want to chat and don't just, you know, or something and kind of give me a chance to respond and say, hey, do you want to talk about this? Do you want to talk about that? And I can go, sure. Or now nah, I'm kind of busy, you know. Um, but, you know, I'm not some kind of... Um, cop for you know busting people for oh you initiated you know what i mean like just just reach out just just chat it's i i yeah. love that about the that mostly for the most part the human design community is very accessible and that you can really i've reached out to a lot of people um you know not having known them and just kind of struck up conversations and yeah you might say well jonah you're a generator are you you know, initiating. And I think as long as it's coming from a place of informing and just kind of stating clearly and just, it's, it's different, you know, and plus it's an email. It's not like I'm, uh, you know, really cornering them at a party or something, uh, you know, <laughs> and telling you, I have all this information for you with my five oneness. <laughs> um, I think it's a, a very good thing to bring up because I often, I often explain to people that Looking at astrology or looking at human design, it is a blueprint. It is a map. I wouldn't describe my whole house by saying, look at my address on Google Maps. In the same way, our like Western chart, birth chart, or human design chart 
is I think Ra actually said this, but it's like being given a script and you can read the script in whatever way you'd like to. It's not the what, it's the how. I tell my students that all the time. It's not the what, it's the how. And with that being said, I have been in positions where I haven't been invited into things like jobs or relationships, but I learned a lot. And also it led to something where I was invited. So even if you're not being, you know, overly militaristic in following your strategy and authority, it may lead you someplace where you're able to more recognize in what way to act in that way. Absolutely. And I, I think it's a great gift um, of having this vocabulary where instead of trying yes. to figure out in advance what all of these terms mean, like someone learning human design, what does it really mean to inform? What is it, how it's informing versus initiating? Just experiment and see for yourself and you will see that the vocabulary is is quite well structured you know ra came up with some really good terms that are very useful for describing interpersonal dynamics and you can kind of learn like you're saying how how you do something and if you do it one way versus a different way um and yeah that's that's a really great point so something i did want to talk about uh you had mentioned and maybe you could tell me a little more about the movement art and some of the language work you've done, some of these other kind of non-human design, but maybe human design adjacent or informed by that. Um, also, yeah. of course, with your right variable cognition and right variable personality. Uh, I'm just always interested in what right variable people are doing with um, kind of bringing in new forms, you know, that this, this, this right variable is such a new consciousness and humanity needs new forms of expression and new practices. And so maybe you could tell me a little bit about some of the new practices you're, you're working on. Yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, for sure. So what I do currently right now, which I kind of feel is the, been my sweet spot for employment actually is I teach uh, English as a second language or English to learners of other languages, um, speakers of other languages through dance and movement. And what I've been looking at with my chart, and I actually, I think it was when you were here, one of the people in our group, was we were going over how I use language and break it down into very small chunks in order to get a particular idea or concept across and then internalizing that with the body or even just teaching with the body in general, if you don't understand the words I'm using, how can we use our body to learn different things and then teach someone else? Because when you learn something, the best way to know that you've actually, like you can assess yourself and that you know something is by teaching it to someone else. So looking at my chart, I have a very strong focus on the body itself. And with my, you know, the 5618, my spleen being almost completely blown up. And then also that 46 love of the body, but that's not activated. Same thing with my, my three is part of my cross. It's been activated unless I am around energy beings. So my thought process in that is that I have to be around, I have to be around those either with transits, but it's more easily and readily accessible when I'm in those environments with the energy beings. Mm -hmm. What I'm really interested in doing and what I'm looking forward to doing, and I invite other people to contact me based on this, is creating dance movement, choreography, and experimenting with how to lead and guide movement based on energy types. So how would I use a generator in a room with other projectors? How would I be able to use particularly splenics, either manifestors or projectors, not only in the movement, but how to direct each other, right? How to experiment with both music and sound and being in other people's auras. You know, I, I've been told that the projector or a specifically can be very intense because of how it just zeroes in on that G G center. Right. And it, when it is not invited, it can be seen as very evasive and not having consent. It's unconsensual energetic penetration basically. And how can we work with auras? How can we like expand or contract? How can we as 
projectors basically be border collies, right? And direct the, the energy of generators, even mangens, to where they need to go and what they need to do. You were discussing, I think, was the 57. If someone doesn't have the 57 or if they do, they literally don't know what they're doing or how to do it. They just start doing things, right? Mm -hmm. Right. There's, uh, there's a lot of like 30, 420s who don't have 57 or 10, and they're just doing things, but it's nothing to do with them. And they don't really have a lot of awareness or insight because there's no awareness between the purely mechanical doing. It's just the, the sacral directly to the throat. So yeah, yeah, I mean, it'd be, it, they can really benefit from having projectors who can kind of see into their process and, um, and help orchestrate or guide them or absolutely. Right. And if we're supposed to be in our bodies to fully live out our design, as far as I understand it, then what better way you know, to do that, been really focusing on the body. And what I noticed a lot, just, just in general throughout living and particularly living in, coming back and living in America is that we are so divorced from our own bodies. We're so disassociated from our bodies and just experiencing the pleasure of our bodies in and of ourselves, not necessarily anything sexual, but just enjoying being in a body, no matter what it is. And then being yeah, able gate to- Yeah, 46 for body. sure is a huge part of that. And that is, um, it's, not, it's in your nodes. And so that's part of your correct environment, uh, I guess. I mean, on the design side might be more the physical environment. And then on the personality side is like what you're noticing in that environment or what you're here to see in that environment since it's the view and the perspective. But um, mm -hmm. it is interesting. Yeah, I, I, I mean, um, yeah, that you're you're here to kind of see that that love of the body and to be be around that and to be in an environment of the celebration of the body, which absolutely can be through dance and through self expression. Um, that's so so cool. I, I really um, I, I met somebody who does Feldenkrais, and I guess Feldenkrais and Rolf, you know, most Feldenkrais and Ida Rolf knew each other and were were friends and colleagues and they both kind of developed i'm really interested in things that were developed since the right variable consciousness emerged and sort of newer modalities for the new era that we live in and i wasn't that familiar with feldenkrais before but from having met someone who was a practitioner who actually studied under most most feldenkrais i learned a little bit about it and some, some of it is like rolling around on the ground until you find like a muscle that hurts or that doesn't fully want to move. And then you just wait in that position. You kind of put mm -hmm. yourself into an unusual position of expression where and then you just discover it and then you just kind of breathe until it releases. And, yes. uh, and I asked what Feldenkrais is kind of for a description. And the person I was talking to, this great practitioner, actually a, a neighbor of mine, she told me one of the best, descriptions, which I think applies to so much. She said, well, we as upright beings have gravity flowing down through the top of our head and out through the bottom of our feet. And how we move our body is how we handle that flow of gravity moving down through us. And yes. if you hold your body in certain places and you get stuck in those places, you're building up muscular tension. And so what Feldenkrais is about is about noticing those places where you've gotten too stuck or patterned in a certain, you know what I mean? In a certain, uh, mm -hmm. you know, gravitational pose to adjust basically because we're all struggling to figure out what are the ways, how do we, how do we dance with gravity as it flows through us? Basically, how do we continue yes. to be supple and to continue to move as this gravity flows through us and not become rigid and stiff and stuck and, and fighting against the gravity? How do we allow the gravity to flow out through the bottom of our feet and not just brace ourselves against it in the same pose as if we're shouldering the burden of gravity? And that was a really interesting description. So I mean, yes. Yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, it's, it's an interesting perspective because in, in, I'm classically trained and a lot of you deal a lot with planes, like how you relate to uh, those around you and your body, but also how you relate to the ground and how you interact with gravity. So for example, something like ballet, you are always escaping the ground. You're always trying to push gravity as much as possible. And then as a result, push your body and contort your body into these crazy, crazy kinds of positions that actually go against our own physiology. 
our natural physiology, whereas something like tap manipulates the ground, right? You want to create rhythm with the ground. You have to use it, but you still have to create some kind of space. Whereas something like modern is all, almost just like growing and grounding into the ground. You know, you think about everyone, I don't know if you know, but everyone who does classical modern, if that's a way to put it, traditional modern of like Martha Graham, their knees get destroyed. So they're just constantly going down to their knees and rolling around on the ground. So I've yeah, I've seen I'm, some, my sister does a bit of, you know, modern dance and there's definitely a lot of writhing on the ground and a lot of, uh, <laughs> yes, it is a very yes. like earth, it feels like an earth magic ritual or something, you know? <laughs> yes, 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 exactly. Exactly. So it's interesting. I've not, perhaps I've heard of that and experienced it. I just didn't know that's what we were doing. Do you know what I mean? I think there's a lot of practitioners that are like, we're just going to warm up or do this and not, I don't have to necessarily explain what we're doing. It's more, not so mind and, and language directed as it is with, with your body, right? Mm -hmm. um, but also, like, you're talking about my um, my rightness, that I also have 41 in my cross, and I also have one. And this is all about new ideas, new things imagining, right? What could possibly be? And not necessarily getting there, but allowing those, whatever those ideas are, the, the shadow of 41 is fantasy, and being able to get into an anticipation that create kind of like mile markers for other people to be drawn into. And I'm also kitchens. So it's if I could get a bunch of different kinds of energy types with a bunch of different backgrounds in one room together that want to experiment in that way. It's like, give me all this stuff to alchemize. Let's see what we can do together. Right. And let's see what we can do in right now. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I feel like I'm built for that. If you could say it that way. And per perhaps that's why I'm drawn to that. But Absolutely. Yeah. I always think of kitchens. Um, kitchens are kind of like a pirate ship, you know, it's like a ragtag <laughs> bunch of people from all different backgrounds. And uh, I've even heard people in the food service industry describe literal kitchens that way of kind of, we're all on the ship together, we all have to coexist together and kind of make it. Yep. You definitely, um, yeah, see see that in the, the literal kitchens, as well as the sort of art collectives and uh, experimental workshops and studios and all, all sorts of things so well that's very exciting and um i i hope that that i can help in some way maybe here in santa fe uh, the uh, unfortunately it's more of a dry kitchen here than a wet kitchen so yes. if you visit which i hope you will we'll have to have the humidifiers on full blast um i've also heard dry kitchens people don't like taking a lot of showers they might shower once a week or use dry shampoos and so on so i imagine as wet kitchens oh. If you're in a dry place, you know, you just need that constant humidity and steam. So you're just like, it's like, ah, time for my third shower. You know, it's, it's a little too dry out. So you can maybe survive baths. in the desert. Yeah. I yeah, just keep like, I just keep my bath uh, semi full. So, well, one also, if we have like a water and warning here in Texas, but, and I try to keep my AC on at opportune times of the day. So it just doesn't go outside my window, but yeah, well, just because it's cold. That's the other part. I can't do steam. I mean, I love bathhouses. Oh, I lived in Asia. right, right, right. We were talking I about this earlier. You kind of need yes. a cold shower. So it's not really yes. or cold plunge. So that's what I'm like, yes, or like going in the rivers or the um, uh, like, what, oh, my gosh, the springs, natural springs, things like that. I think you have that in up in that area don't oh, you we have some wonderful very cold um freshet which is the name for snow melt water that comes down off the mountains because we're at high elevation here we're at seven thousand feet and we have um so even in summertime you can go to some very cold rivers and pools and ponds and stuff so you can definitely definitely do that well uh yeah i'd, I'd love to um to see where where it all goes with with your um kind of fantasy and creativity for, uh, you know, developing new forms. And uh, I hope we can get an update on that. I'd love to have you back on as a guest in the future. It's been a really, really fun conversation. And um, yeah, as you mentioned, uh, anyone can, who wants to get a hold of you, Taoista or Taoista, you know, as it's spelled T-A-O-I-S-T-A 0101 at gmail.com. And they yes. get a hold of you. And uh, thank you so much. This has been such a fun conversation. I've loved it. So. Yes, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And I, I'm really glad to be a part of this human design community. And like you said, it's very opening and welcoming. So absolutely. Well, hopefully we can do a um, 
we can convince Dave to do a human design Austin event. In, yes. uh, I know he's yes. doing, you know, yes. meetups in the meantime, but it'd be nice to actually kind of bring people in and, and have talks and stuff like that. So maybe we can do yes. Yes. human design Austin oh, 2024. Oh. 2024. This, is a, this is a nice, uh, how do I say? It's a nice like doorknob confession. Like you have in therapy where like, oh, I remembered a thing. And then you're like, time's up. We have to walk out. But something that Dave brought up that perhaps we can talk in a different time was the importance of circuitry and how like underestimated it is, especially when you're interacting with friends or like dating and that there's so much you don't have to explain that is already understood and assumed in the body when you have similar circuitry, particularly tribal. But well, that's a, that's that's a great point. Time. I think, well, and I have a, one little comment on that. Um, there's a guy named Cohen Hillowart who is the first one uh, I know who really did a, um, oh, he's a little bit of a controversial figure because he runs the projector group with an iron fist. Oh, yes. But, uh, yes, I'm part of it. And yeah, it is and wild uh, you know, delete, delete comments without telling people. Or delete people, friends. yes. Or just delete people. Yeah, that too, that too. Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, he has, what, he has individual circuitry and I, I don't fully know his chart, but um, he's very empowered, I'll tell you that. But <laughs> but in any case, uh, he's an interesting guy. Um but he's the one who I first came to my attention kind of bringing up circuitry and he may overstate it, but it still is interesting that he, he had some kind of original um, observations I hadn't encountered before that people with individual circuitry, for instance, uh, like, yeah, you, you have no individual uh, channels. No, just, just I, like me. I don't, I, I thought I had, I have, well, I have the 28, but that's hanging. Right. And I have some individual gates, but the channels are what really, I mean, it's kind of, you know, we, it's very rare to have someone that won't have any um, gate in a circuit group, but what's, what's more common. And I think what's more, more important and what he would point out is like, so you have collective abstract, collective logic, and you have tribal. And so those are going to be very important um, dynamics for you, but because you don't have individual, for instance, like me, you might not be as acoustically sensitive and sometimes we might not realize until we've learned, I, I will put a caveat on Cohen's work because he almost makes it out like a death sentence. Like we don't have individuals. So if we're in a relationship with someone who does have individual, we're just not going to understand them. I don't think that's true at all because that's where the wisdom comes in. We have to learn over a long time and how we develop the wisdom, like the wisdom of the undefined centers or the wisdom of the hanging gates or the wisdom, you know, all of the openness in the whole chart is potential for wisdom. We get that every time we experience something that activates it and we don't make a decision out of that. So every time you have a 3536 transit or someone who's around who makes you really emotional and then you go, ah, I'm feeling emotional. I'm just going to check out from this and have a little perspective. Not going to uh -huh. decide to quit. Not going to decide to, you know, tell them off. Not going to decide to any of that stuff. Just you kind of, right. with, you abstain from making a decision and then you've gained the wisdom and you go, wow. So that's what that was like feeling that 3536. No, it's really funny you bring that up because I just yeah. had that experience with someone here where we were having a conversation and then all of a sudden it got really emotional and it wasn't even really emotional subject. And we both started crying and it was, I was just like really overwhelming. And I'm like, what the, what transits are going on? And we both looked at our phone and we're like, oh, it's the 35, 36. And it was just for like two hours. <laughs> like, oh, so that's what that <laughs> right. feels Sometimes like. the moon can be the strongest one sometimes because it comes yeah. out of the blue and it makes the whole focus that. And so anyway, yeah, I, I think that's a really good point about circuitry. And I just want to say, not having circuitry of a certain kind, yeah, it's good to be aware. Uh, like I don't have tribal circuitry, so it's taken me a really long time to kind of learn um, how a lot of that works and to really learn about loyalty and to learn about support and to learn about need and to learn about all these things that are kind of foreign to me. I've had to go to school there. Doesn't mean I can't be in a happy relationship or a happy business partnership or a happy friendship or any of these things with someone who's tribal. Um, but yeah, I, I do think Cohen pointed out some interesting things that people with individual circuitry are really acoustically sensitive. And one of their main complaints can be 
that other person, my partner, doesn't hear what I'm really saying or doesn't listen to me or speaks to me oh. harshly or kind of acoustic oriented. Whereas when we have collective, okay. we can be more embarrassed about how things look. Like it just doesn't look very good. Like I don't mind if we have a disagreement in private, but do we really have to talk about it in front of these other people? And then it turns into the individual person saying, you care more about the people you have over at your house than me, or you know what I mean? It's kind of um, oh, you know, individual that's very takes the, to point out. Yeah, there's just a lot I'm of, yeah, because we're so visual. So it's like, I've definitely been in relationships where I've thought we look good together. And that's like a thumbs up for like, right, if I right, look right, good right. with someone. I mean, you might say it's superficial, but that's the collective way. We look good to the collective. We have a good collective image nice. together. Yeah. I mean, we have a good, and we can share in these experiences together. And we have a lot of things we can share in what we care about and share in what we're interested in. And the individual might care less about sharing and they care more about, um, you know, that person. It's very personal for the individual. And then of course, tribal is about support. So that's a really good point. And I think um, that's a really good topic. I might even um, do that next week for Human Design Catalyst. We have a weekly uh, HD Catalyst group here in Santa Fe where we just do a topic of the week and um oh wow once a week that's amazing we can every barely monday, get it. yeah every monday night a at month over here. We have, my friend mike has this little retail space and uh we've been doing it about four years now it's great it's really fun it became kind of a you're a gate five you know you you, you could probably enjoy having that that weekly fixed rhythm so maybe uh see if dave or anyone we're else trying. in the austin community wants to get it going and yeah we're trying we're doing our best we're doing our best the person well, that i had he... a great time there i loved meeting everyone and i just love austin austin to me is um definitely somewhere i want to add to my list of homes or places that feel like home and i i, I want to oh. you know get out there at least once a year if not more so hopefully we can put together an event and uh and take it from there yes so. Okay, well, thank you so much. Till next time. Till next time. Thanks again, Jonah. Have a good day. You as well. Bye.